Every now and then on the internet or on email or if you're a parish rector, you'll hear somebody mutter, and mutter is the word, why don't they preach about sin anymore? Now, the funny thing about this, as you know, is that the people who would like the preacher to say something about sin have in mind some particular sins that they would like the preacher to preach about, and they are rarely the ones that the mutterer finds tempting. The mutterer would really like somebody to stand up before a crowd of people and finger wag at those people, whoever they are. And there's a conservative version of this and there's a liberal version of it. <laughs> it's all the same. It's all the same. It's finger wagging. Well, I'm going to venture a guess, and I normally don't like to make guesses about what sins people in a group of room are, are, are tempted to, and I normally don't like to make guesses. I've heard a preacher once say that nobody here is called to martyrdom, and I thought, oh, really? I don't like that kind of guessing, but I'm going to venture to say that probably, probably no one here is tempted by the sin of mass violence. It's probably not a thing we're looking to do. It's not our go-to strategy for solving our problems, right? We're, we're mostly a crowd that we have our, our sins, but it's not that one. We're not gonna fly planes into buildings, right? We're not going to drive cars through people on a beach in France. We're not going to do that kind of stuff. But as it happens, as it happens, we do live in a society and in a country, sad to say, that has its share of violence. And it's often done in our name. I remember seeing a photo on Facebook, that wonderful source of political news, and it was of some people who had been injured by a bomb dropped by an American drone or fired by an American drone, whatever the word is. There were two pictures and they were different, but they were virtually identical, virtually identical. And one of them said killed by a Republican bomb and the other one said killed by a Democratic bomb. Because we don't have any candidates for president including Ms. Stein, if you were confused about this. We don't have any candidates for president who have not declared their willingness to drop bombs on people. They just differ about who, when, and why. And I'm not saying that the differences don't matter. They most certainly do. But they all have some willingness to use violence as a means of solving a problem. And we need to know that, and we need to own it. Some believe it's justifiable, some believe it's not, but we have to at least be willing to acknowledge that it is done, and done in our name. And then we can start talking about whether it's justifiable and when. But even those who say that it's sometimes justifiable agree that there are limits. And if you go look, you will see that we cross the limits all the time. Advocates of the death penalty will tell us that the death penalty has its uses, that it's good for society, of course, it should be only inflicted on those who are guilty, but it is not, in fact, only inflicted on those who are guilty. And when an innocent person is killed in our name, we need to own that and not say, well, everybody did the best they could. Because we know we don't always do the best we could. So, there's plenty of sin to go around, you see.
The key part of today's beautiful parables is about Jesus and sinners. But I want, before getting to that, to look at what Paul said. He said, see, I'm the chief of sinners. I'm the sinnerest of the bunch, a man of violence, he says, and he was. He used violence as a tool to suppress a religious movement he didn't agree with. He participated in the killing of Stephen by stoning, which is a particularly brutal way to die, out of motivated by religious zealotry. Now, the technology in the first century AD was not up to modern standards. So Paul's religiously motivated attack on a religion he didn't approve of couldn't kill that many people. But I don't think the difference in technology should be understood as a difference in Paul's willingness to kill. I rather suspect if he'd had access to modern technology, he would have killed in modern numbers instead of ancient numbers. Paul in heaven is probably very glad he did not have access to modern technology. And he was shown mercy, mercy. In fact, what were Jesus' words to him on the Damascus Road? Jesus said, why are you persecuting me? It hurts to kick against the goads, the spurs. Jesus isn't saying it hurts me. Jesus is saying, this is hurting you, Paul. This is hurting you. Why are you doing this? It's hurting you. Can't you see that? Can't you see what it's doing to you? I imagine Paul reflecting on his earlier days before he had started onto this course of murder and judicial execution and whatever else, and thinking, wow, I have come a long way and maybe not liking what he saw very much in himself, I think Paul quickly agreed that it was hurting him. So Paul is led, now blind, to Damascus. And the next thing I think is very interesting, I don't think Paul is yet converted in that story, by the way. The conversion of Paul, in my opinion, has not yet happened. He's suddenly become blind. And in gospel talk, we know that to, be, to know that you are blind is the first step in healing, right? The Pharisees are criticized by Jesus for believing they could see when they can't. If you knew you were blind, then you would be able to see. Paul now is blind, but he's not yet converted. He's led to Damascus, and he stays And then Jesus appears to a disciple in Damascus named Ananias and says, Ananias, I've got a job for you. Ananias is ready. Sure, but what should I do? Paul's in town. Yeah, I know. We're all terrified. He's coming here to arrest us. We don't know what to do. Yeah, well, here's what you're going to do. He's staying at a street, and he's going to need you to lay hands on him because he's blind. He needs some medical care. And Ananias says, um, uh, he's coming to kill us. You, you, You know that, right? You want me to do what? Don't worry. He will discover what it is to be my disciple. He will suffer for my name. Just go do what you've been told. So Ananias goes. 
and he lays hands on Jesus, prays for him, lays hands on Paul, prays for him, invokes the name of Jesus, and the scales fell from Paul's eyes. And I believe that is when Paul was converted. It is when he experienced the mercy. It's when someone who had every right to be terrified of him showed him mercy and healed him that Paul was converted and lived a life from that moment on in which he was from time to time subject to persecution from the very same people that he had once been buddies with and others to boot all the way up until finally, according to the tradition, he was beheaded by the Emperor Nero. That is mercy. That is God's way of dealing with men of violence. Now, what about the parables? If we are a culture that is itself a little too happy with violence, what of us? What of us? Well, God is like a woman searching for her lost money, desperately sweeping the house willing to overturn heaven and earth to claim us back. God is a shepherd who will do a rather bizarre thing, leave almost a hundred sheep in the wilderness and vulnerable just to find us. But what about fear? What about the fear that Ananias felt? It's all very well and good to say, trust in God, but one is still afraid, aren't we? Especially when you've suffered a serious attack and you don't know when the next one will come. Or after a big earthquake, People are very terrified, and they know that aftershocks are real. They know that that earthquake they felt isn't over yet, right? What about fear? I think the answer to that for Christians starts on Easter Sunday, and it works like this. We know that Christ is raised from the dead. And because of that, we know that nothing can finally defeat us. And when we know that nothing can finally defeat us, we can see what happens on the cross a few days before. Christ, who also knew that nothing could finally defeat him, accepted the violence of the world. He did not, interestingly enough, tell everyone to stop. There was no display of power. There was no forcible disarmament of anyone. It was rather like Ananias, you see. Ananias in a little way, Stephen in a little way, Paul in a little way, and Jesus for the world. Jesus accepted the world's violence to show its powerlessness, to defuse it, to rob it of power, to show that even at its absolute worst, it cannot defeat life and it cannot defeat us. And then in that confidence, in that sure and certain faith, as the burial service has it, 
we then can become Ananias. And when we are Ananias, we become the agents of conversion. And when we become the agents of conversion, now and then, from time to time, a precious coin is recovered and polished off. And eventually, all of the precious coins are found, and all of the sheep are recovered, and we can all sit together as the flock of one shepherd. <laughs>